Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to yet another episode of the Tennis Loss Podcast. It's always really fun for me to do these episodes live um, with some great guests. And we have today on Coach Edgar Giffenig, who uh, is a really great coach. And I've had him on several of my tennis summits. And he's written books about tennis. And he is you know, creating great content about tennis. And so, uh, Edgar, I want to welcome you to the Tennis Loss Podcast. And thank you for joining. Thank you, Marvin. Great to be here. Definitely, definitely great to be here. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about single strategy. Obviously, uh, you know, it's a part of the game that's really difficult sometimes for us to figure out. I get a lot of questions from guests about, you know, what should I, what shot should I hit in this particular situation? How can I plan better um, before matches? How can I um, do a postmortem on my matches for my singles uh, play? And so that's why we're going to have this episode for you today and also answer your questions live as well. Um, unless you're listening to this on the audio version only, then in that case, you know, it's not live. But um, yeah, so uh, Edgar, you know, I just want to jump straight into it uh, as far as uh, tennis strategy, single strategy. I was fascinated by your comparison of single strategy um, to be kind of like gambling, um, and I saw this in your latest course that's coming up. So I was curious if you could explain to us why it's helpful for us to think about single strategy like we do uh, with gambling. I think basically what your goal on the court is when you're competing is to give yourself the best chance of winning. That means that you have to play the odds. And that there's a term in tennis that's called percentage tennis. And what that means is that you're choosing the shots that will give you the best chance of winning the point. So you're, if, uh, if my tops and back end gives me an 80% chance of winning the point and my slice only gives me a 60%, I got to stick with my topspin as much as possible because in the long run, it adds up and that is going to be the best uh, way to, to win. If I, if by coming to the net, I'm winning... 60% of the points and by staying back, I'm only winning 40% of the points, then I should try to add more coming into the net just to improve my chances of winning. And uh, whether it's singles or doubles, you, you, you really have to play the odds. But to, in order to be able to do that, you really have to understand your game. And I think a lot of people have a hard time with their strategy because they're not clear on what they can and cannot do. So if uh, all of us uh, hit great shots and all of us ha have hit a, a Federer forehand at some point, but if we believe that that's our normal forehand, we're probably going to make one out of 20 and that's not going to win many matches. Yeah, your great explanation. And so, uh, you know, when you talked about, you know, shots coming to you and if you hit a slice backhand versus a topspin backhand, you have to know which one is going to give you the better chance of winning, like in gambling. Uh, and I'm a big poker fan, too, so I calculate all those odds, you know, depending on what cards I have and what's on the board. But anyways, in that scenario, like what what types of things are we thinking about to actually determine which of these shots will give me the better chance of winning the point it seems like there are a lot of different variables to process in such a short amount of time well the first thing would be know your game and how do we do that well you have to do a lot of drills where you focus on consistency and uh, i like to throw out the the number eight out there because i i always think eight is a good goal for you to to reach in terms of consistency that means you want to balance power and consistency when you're practicing. So if, if my goal is to get 50 balls in, well, maybe I can do that if I just lob it, but that's not how I'm going to play. So I want to I wanna be aggressive and I want to try to find that thin line in my game where I can be as aggressive as possible, but still consistently enough to be effective, right? So if I'm practicing and I'm missing every third ball, that means that I'm probably hitting at a speed that is above my capabilities or I'm hitting the type of shots that are uh, too risky. And so I need to, whenever, I, whenever I'm on the court, I need to try to kind of look for that eight, eight fast shots, this average of making at least eight balls. If I am making 15, well, hit it harder. Try to, try to push it a little bit. 
if I'm only making three, well, hit more topspin, slow it down, do find find a way to get a few more balls in. And so if you every time that you get on the court and you drill, you you kind of have this uh, this search for that ideal line between power and control. After a while, you start understanding. Okay, at this pace, I should be able to make eight balls. So if something, uh, when I'm playing singles, this is a kind of a good pace for me. Maybe it's a 75% of what I can do somewhere in there. Uh, another way of doing it is exercises where you kind of start hitting maybe five really slow ones. Then you go five faster ones, five mm -hmm. faster ones. And then you start kind of uh, understanding where, where does it break down. And so when you're playing a match, if I, if normally my, my game breaks down at 80, 90% of my capability in terms of speed, uh, I better choose those kind of shots when I'm up 40, 15 and not when I'm down a break point or something like that, because the odds is I'm probably going to miss it or it's 50, 50 chance. So you, before, before you bet, you just got to know the odds. And that's, <laughs> I guess that's the difference between the professional poker players and, and the amateurs, right? And so it's a little bit the same thing in tennis. It's like the amateurs are, are playing against the odds because they believe they can hit much better shots than they're capable of, of, of hitting. And yes, they might hit it once or twice, but that's not going to win matches. Yeah, I love that idea of, you know, needing to find your range and then also making sure that you practice um, appropriately to how your matches are going to be, you know, with the proper intensity. Um, and how do players actually, because I'm sure a lot of us listening want to increase that, 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 you know, eight ball basically like range to a mix of power and consistency, um, you know, make it more powerful as well. So I, maybe this is more technical, but how do we actually, uh, keep increasing the quality of that, uh, eight ball uh, range? Yeah. I mean, that, that's basically the, the way it works is you find out where you are and then you find out what you need to do to go to the next level. And so for that, you probably need a little bit of an advice of a pro to what you play and see where, where it's breaking down. You know, in, in, like you say, it, it's probably a technical aspect. Yeah, uh, and you have to have a solid enough technique to be able to uh, accelerate the ball at more speed. So basically, Technique, what it does, it allows you to play more efficiently. That means if you have better technique, you're going to be able to hit the ball more consistently at higher speeds. Yeah, no, great stuff, Edgar. And so how do we prioritize whether we should work on the you know technique aspect first or strategy? Is it such that you know, if we want to implement a strategy and then we don't have the technique for it, then we go and work on the technique or is it something, some other approach uh, better? I always like the approach to, uh, to kind of focus on strategy first. What do I want to do on the court and then see if I can do it? Mm. Okay. So if I, if I know that I need to be able to hit a high defensive lob when on the run or high top spin shot when on the run to, to get back on the neutral situation, then, okay, that is a strategy that I want to implement. So now, what technical tools do I need to be able to implement that strategy? So if I cannot technically hit the ball high with topspin, well, it doesn't matter how much uh, tactical knowledge I have, I'm not going to be able to do it. And ideally, what we want to do uh, in, in tactic, in the tactical aspect, is you want to be able to play automatically. A lot of people think that tactical tennis means, okay, this guy is really smart. So he kind of knows uh, what to do. Well, yes and no. I mean, he does know what to do, but part of it is he's been in that, he or she has been in that situation enough to know exactly when I see the situation like a picture, I'm going to react this way. This is the right way to react. And so I have to, if I want to play solid tennis, I have to put myself and I have to practice specific situations that are causing me trouble over and over and over until I can execute it technically well and until it becomes second nature. 
Yeah, very well put, um, Edgar. Appreciate that. We're getting a bunch of questions already from the audience, so I want to shift over to some of those and then trade with my my own questions that I've prepared. So uh, Jordan, uh, who is a great uh, listener of the podcast, uh, is, is practicing against a wall a good way to improve ground strokes? And then I would add, are there any specific adjustments that you you make uh, when you practice against the wall? Uh, for, for some of you that have heard me speak before or that have read my books, I am a big believer in uh, developing stroke flexibility. And what that means is the ability to hit any type of ball that's coming to you, high, low, with spin, with no spin, uh, fast, slow, and send it back with the desired combination of speed, height, spin, placement. So that means in, in tennis, uh, the technical component of, uh, of tennis, uh, a lot of people focus on how you hit the ball. And I'd like to hit, I like to work on how, what do I want to do with the ball? And can I do that? So you, it's not a, I don't want to think about technique as being like a form like the racket has to have this form or I have to bring the racket here, put it down, do that. But I have to be able, on the forehand side, I have to be able to hit the ball high, low, fast, slow, topspin, slice. And so I, I, I'd like to practice that way. So I, what I always preach is that you have to try to practice with a lot of flexibility. That means instead of hitting uh, forehands for... 20 minutes cross court, what you want to try to do is, okay, you hit three minutes high forehands, then you hit three minutes slice forehands, then you hit three minutes uh, with a lot of top spin, then you hit three minutes flat, then you hit uh, three minutes uh, really low balls. And so you really kind of try to develop those tools that you're going to need later on in the tactical aspect. So that, that is how the technical and the tactical go together. You cannot really separate it. Why do I want to be able to hit the ball high? Well, when I'm defense, I have to hit it high. Where, why do I want to hit the ball with a lot of spin? Well, if the ball is short and I'm inside the court, I better hit a lot of spin because if not, it's going to go out. Mm -hmm. So I have to kind of develop those tools in order to be able to, to, get the, to, be able to put them in, in practice on the tactical aspect. And so the question about the wall, I think the wall is great. But what I would recommend is that you try different things on the wall. So not only like just hit your forehand and hit the thousands of the same forehands, but try to vary, try to be specific. Okay, let's try to hit it a little bit higher. Let's try to hit it a little bit lower. Let's try to hit it with more spin. Let's try to hit it with a little slice. Got it. Got it. Yeah, no, great advice there on hitting with the wall. Um, change it up for sure. Um, get different balls to hit against it. Uh, we have a question uh, from Alok, which uh, he says, I need help against athletic pushers slash blockers. No matter how hard I hit and take them out of the court, the ball keeps coming back with no power. After hitting two to three aggressive shots, I will hit the fourth one out. So uh, what are your thoughts? I know you talked about, you know, the eight ball, uh, you know, approach. But what else do you do you think about uh, this question, Edgar? Uh, well, I think it's very important to understand how to handle different types of players. And uh, <laughs> nobody likes a pusher, it's especially if you don't have the ability to counter a slow, consistent ball. And so what, what basically uh, Alok is telling me is that he doesn't really have a, an ability to finish the point effectively. And so he has to develop some tools to be able to do that. And uh, when you play against somebody that's very fast and gets the ball in, well, the first thing that you need to kind of understand is that the guy is actually doing the right thing. You know, tennis, you win by getting the ball in. It doesn't matter how hard or slow, if you're hitting it out, no matter how, if you hit bullets, they're out, you don't get extra points. So they got to be over the net and into the court to count. So the guys that we kind of call pushers kind of have the right idea of the game. So your basic concept should be, okay, let's get the ball in. Let's make sure that I'm not missing the ball. Let's make sure that the opponent is beating me and that I'm not beating myself. Now back to the question, okay, how do you play 
those type of players. Well, the first thing that you need to make sure is that you're not beating yourself. Alok uh, sounds like he is beating himself because he says after hitting two or three aggressive shots, I will hit the fourth one out. So that means that he's he's making the mistakes. So against the very consistent players, the first thing that you need to do is you need to be more patient. So the good thing about that is first, most likely they are not going to attack you. So you don't have to worry too much about hitting great shots because they're probably just going to get it back. It, that's kind of their game style. So you can pick your moment. You can keep the ball in until you have a really good shot that you can attack. So you don't have to start attacking right away. The other important thing is that you want to maybe don't think about power so much, but think about taking time away from the opponent. What does that mean? Instead of trying to blast a bullet from the same spot on the court, try to see if you can catch the ball early. Try to see if you, you can hit a good shot and when you see the opponent stretched, move forward, catch the next one in the air and just hit it to the other side. So, so that way, if you're catching the ball earlier or even in the air, you are forcing the opponent without actually trying to hit the ball harder. And that is kind of the goal. You don't want to be risking while attacking. And if, you just, if, if your answer is just to hit the ball harder every time, well, it's going to come to a point where you're going to make a mistake. So very, very important. If you want to beat very consistent players, you have to develop a better net play. And especially you have to develop a better overheads. Because most likely when you come to the net, the first thing that they're going to do is lob you. And so if I'm missing my overhead or if I'm getting passed by a lob, I'm letting the opponent beat me with the easiest shot possible. So if I want to improve my chances of winning matches against very consistent players that just kind of push the ball over, I need to be able to finish the point. And I would start by working on my overhead so that every time they lob me, I'm ready and I'm going to hit a good overhead. Then I'm going to work on high volleys. Why high volleys? Because most likely those guys don't have that much power. So if I am winning the high volleys and I am just losing the points where the guy actually hit a nice passing shot, okay, that's different. But most likely I'm giving them a lot of free points by missing easy shots. So really work on putting away the easy shots, putting and work on taking time away from the opponent. You have them stretch, you move forward into the court, try to catch the ball early, and then just change directions. If you can catch it in the air, even better. Yeah, I love that advice, Edgar. I would be curious a lot for you to analyze, you know, why you're missing that fourth shot. Um, you know, are you going for too much? Are you off balance? Do you kind of lose patience in the rally? Um, and then, like Edgar said, you know, you need to really practice, um, you know, your your high volleys, your overheads. And also, I would just add that, you know, in the beginning, when you do practice this more aggressive uh, you know, type of game, it, it may be a little frustrating. You may miss a couple, but you have to really stick with it. Because I remember when I, you know, was afraid to serve in volley and, you know, I'd miss a few volleys and I'd go back to just like a pure baseline game. But if you stick with it and then you're gradually going to get more comfortable up there uh, and more consistent with that and it'll make a big difference. So definitely keep at it there. Um, so thanks for that question. And we have one from uh, Ja, which I'm not sure how familiar you know you are with all the like I guess tech and all that uh, tracking matches, Edgar. But we have a question about um, tracking. How can we track the um, like percentages? I guess during a match, like generally, do you know of any good tracking platforms for when somebody plays a match to actually look back at their um, you know their their percentages and stats? Well, there's, there's a lot of things out there and they, there are actually some services that will take your whole match and kind of give you the statistics uh, for that match. Uh, I normally, what I do is I, I like to track very specific things. So I, I don't like to track like everything. So when I'm tracking something, I want to be very specific. Like I, I, want to, I want to understand, okay, uh, identify what, what the real problem is and then really try to track that. So uh, some of the basic things that I, I like to track is, for instance, return mistakes 
or double faults. I think uh, yeah. there's a there's a lot of matches lost because the player is not able to put the ball in play. So if you think about it, if you miss two returns every time you return thirds, it doesn't sound bad. Okay, I missed two returns. I mean, that's kind of normal. Well, it's love 30. <laughs> so if you miss two returns, you're down love 30. So you have to win four balls to, to, to make up for that. So giving the opponent love 30 every time they serve, you're probably never going to break the guy or the girl, right? So, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds kind of, yeah, well, two returns, that, that's not too bad. That's normal. Well, it's not really normal. you <laughs> you got to start the point, really. I mean, it, if you fo really focus on cutting down initial mistakes in the point, you're already one step ahead. So one of my great advice to players is make sure that you start the point right. Yeah, Edgar, no, that's brilliant advice. And, you know, I go back to um, thinking about Craig O'Shaughnessy. Um, you know, he advised Djokovic, uh, you know, numerous times. And so, you know, he talks about the the first four shots. And, I mean, it's just in line with what you're saying. I mean, if if we have these, like, issues and leaks with our return game and our, you know, we're double faulting, and we'll get to that too, uh, you know, about the uh, U.S. Open men's final match. But, then we're giving away, uh, you know, big leads and uh, a lot of um, points that, uh, you know, we should be trying to win and not just throw away. So um, just to build on that, I guess, Edgar, I'm curious about your thoughts about the match uh, last night against, uh, well, it was uh, Alexander Zverev against Dominic Team. you know, really great match. But, you know, there was a lot of talk about uh, Alexander Zverev's uh, second serve and that he... Uh, was missing a lot of them. You saw the double faults late in the, in the tie break, the most crucial point. So I uh, was wondering of your observations as well on, you know, maybe what is the cause of that potentially and any other, um, you know, things that came to mind as far as single strategy is concerned. I mean, I, I thought really Sverev should have won the match. Yeah. He had it several times. And the uh, tie break, those double faults, he, he was either dead or, or really got tight because yeah. he really slowed down his second serve. It was just kind of barely getting over the net. He, he wasn't even swinging at, at, at that uh, serve. I know during the match, uh, what he was doing is that he was taking some chances and going for some big second serve. And that goes a little bit back to what I was talking about early. You know, it's like a casino. I mean, as the guy is like 6'10", uh, something like that. I don't know exactly what he is, but he's really big. He has a great serve. So those type of guys gambling on a second serve may pay off. I mean, if I, if I try to hit my second serve like the first one, I mean, I'm not going to do too much because the opponent is still going to be able to get it back. So why am I gambling on something that I might miss more and it's not giving me the result even when I make it? In his case... Total opposite, right? In his case, if he really makes that second serve like a first one, he's probably going to win four out of five points. Mm -hmm. So even if he double faults once in a while, he's still the odds are still helping him. So And that's kind of the job of the coach and the job of the player to understand exactly that. So if, you if you're going to take a chance and you're going to make more mistakes by taking that chance, you better make darn sure that when you make that shot, it's going to pay. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of how, how he, he was looking at his second serve. And in his case, I don't think it's a bad idea. Uh, one of the things I think he did really well and that he probably should have done more is just attack the net on, on the team's backhand. I mean, everybody's yeah. the team is, is a, has a great backhand. But still a one-hander, still you can get him really stretched and no, I mean, not even team can, can make those shots while well, totally straight, stretched. So I think uh, I think he had the right approach. I, I also, uh, one of the keys that I, I think uh, for everyone, I mean, I, I have something in my book that I call the loss of the battle, which is kind of like the right strategy for, for a given position on the court. And one of my loss of the battle is that if the opponent is, is uh, returning really far from the net 
to serve and volley once in a while. Why? Because it gives you a lot of time to get close to the net. So the opponent has to hit a great shot to beat you. So that Zverev was doing that. So Zverev the team was way behind. And so that allows Zverev to really get tight on the net on that first volley. And so that's a, another good thing that he was doing. Uh, he did a great job hitting that forehand down the line when he was team off the court. And that is uh, also something that, that uh, it's very important. The, the cross court or the down the line, that's, that's a basic strategy in tennis. So in ten tennis, is a cross court game, basically. What that means is that not much can go wrong if you keep hitting the ball cross court. I mean, you could keep be hitting the, the ball cross court the whole match and you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape. But if you try to hit the ball down the line the whole match, then you're going to be running like crazy. So if you're playing to, to exercise, hit down the line, keep hitting down the line, you're going to be running like crazy. But if you're, hitting to, if you're playing to win, you better hold on on those down the lines until you can force the opponent or, on, or uh, if you're kind of playing from the middle of the court, it doesn't really matter that much. But mm -hmm. if you're close to the lines, make sure that you hit cross court. And only hit down the line when you can force the opponent. And Zverev was doing really well, the, exactly that. He was opening the court with the forehand cross court most of the time. And then team would hit an angle on that. And Federer, and, uh, sorry, and, and Zverev with his power would just go down the line. And uh, he hit uh, several winners on that. Yeah, it was a brilliant match. And um, I appreciate that analysis. And uh, yeah, took a lot of heart to... To get through that match, um, we've got another question. Got quite a few. Samantha, hello. Um, how do you properly prepare for a singles tournament when you're not getting a lot of tournament practice at tennis clubs? Very good question. That is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to practice to prepare for tournaments is match play and playing tournaments. So there, there is really a reason why the pros play so much and uh, the top juniors play so much because if you don't play enough matches your game never develops you cannot be i mean just practicing will only get you to a certain point really the best practice that you can have is playing matches and the, the, you play matches and kind of to understand where you are what am i missing what's happening when am i getting nervous why am I choking in these situations? And if you never really experience that, it's very difficult to play a tournament. So the short answer is, if you want to do well in tournaments, you got to play a lot of tournaments. And the best way to prepare for the tournaments is playing a lot of matches and then just kind of practicing the things that you see happening during those matches. You have Normally, there are patterns, okay? I... Uh, I feel that when the opponent uh, attacks me to this point, uh, I don't know what to do. Or oh, I hate playing pusher because every time I play a pusher, I cannot put the ball away. Or uh, I hate when somebody's coming to the net and uh, attacking me the whole time. So basically, those uh, matches are going to give you the answer to the things that you need to work on. So if, you, if somebody's coming to the net and beating you every time, well, you probably don't have... Uh, you're not be able to, to place the passing shot low enough or cross court enough, or you're not able to lob well enough. So it, it just gives you cues of where you are. Yeah. I appreciate that uh, answer. And um, yeah, it's obviously very tough if you're not getting to practice much. I mean, of course you can think about, you know, things uh, like what we're talking about today, the strategy part, you can, you know, make, make a game plan before you go out there and, you know, play to your strengths. And if you know the opponent, try to play to their weaknesses, but yeah, you know, nothing takes the place of practice, but you can at least kind of think uh, a little in, before you play and, and make a plan. Uh, we have a lot of great questions here. I'm going to go back to a couple of mine uh, selfishly. Um, so Edgar, you talk about um, the importance of knowing the geometry on the tennis court. And so I would just want to ask you if you could explain a little further, you know, the importance of knowing the geometry of a court and the intricacies involved in that. Yeah, that's a little bit hard to do just uh, without visuals, but okay, let's, let me see yeah. if we can do it. Basically, when you're talking about the geometry of the court, it means understanding the dimensions of the court. Why, where is the playing field? 
And where does that put me in relation to the playing field with the net, the sidelines, the baseline? How far can I hit? What happens if I hit cross court? What happens if I hit down the line? So you kind of follow the angles of the shots. And the if you study the different possibilities when you're on the court in terms of what the angles of the shot can mean or where would they take you if the ball is coming from the right hand of the court and they hit an angle, where would I have to run to get it? And what options does the opponent have if they go down the line? How far can they get me off the court? So if you kind of study the court a little bit and understand uh, the, the geometry, understand how the, the basics of the court, you're going to come to a few conclusions. And basically what the geometry of the, tour, the court dictates is where should I stand to be able to take advantage uh, for, for the, uh, to, to be able to cover best the court. That's one thing that the geometry tells you. And basically, uh, what, it, what it tells you is that for every shot that you hit, you should place yourself in the middle of the best possible shots of your opponent. Okay, so that means if I hit a ball into the corner of the opposite court, let's say uh, if it's a right-handed player I'm playing against, and I hit it to his to his forehand on the corner over there. So the player has two options. He can either hit a down the line shot right on the line, so parallel. He can hit the ball parallel and hit right on the singles line. That is as far as I would have to move to get that ball. Mm -hmm. Or they can hit cross court. But if they hit cross court, they can actually dissect the sideline and make me run a lot farther. So I'm going to have to stand a little bit, not in the middle of the court, because if I stand in the middle of the court, I'm close to this, uh, to my sideline on my backhand side. That means that this the down the line shot, I'm going to be close to that one. But if they hit an angle, I'm going to be pretty far from that shot. So I really should be standing a little bit to the right of the center line. So the geometry of the court basically tells me that the position for the next shot of the opponent, my position should vary depending on my shot. Depending on where I hit the shot, I need to be moving to that position before the opponent hits it in order to be able to, to hit either shot that he hits. It's, like I said, it's a little complicated with, without the uh, graphics, but I hope uh, people are, are getting the idea. And it also tells you, okay, how far should I, should I play? Should I play close to the baseline or should I back up or should I play inside the court? Well, there's advantage and disadvantage to, to all, all, all of those options. So basically what you want to try to do is gain time from the opponent. That means you're taking time away from the opponent by hitting the ball as close as possible to where it bounces. The closer that I get to the net, the more angles I can hit, the wider my angles are going to be. The further back I play, the harder it is for me to hit an angle and to hit the person off the court. So I want to try to play close to the net to be able to hit angles and make the opponent run wider every time. Of course, in order to hit closer to the bounce, I gotta move faster and I, I have to keep my ball deep because if I'm keeping my ball short, the opponent is going to attack me and I'm going to have to back up to gain time because if, if I don't back up, then I'm not going to get the ball. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that the, the geometry of the court really teaches you. And basically from, from the way the court is set up with the net and all that, we know that when we're in, in a defensive position, we have to gain time so that the next shot, we have a better chance. So how do I do that? Well, hit the ball high, use different heights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so those are basically some of the things that, that just understanding the, the court will, will teach us tactically, you know, hit the ball cross court. Why cross court? Because if I hit the ball cross court, I don't have, I, I'm in a better position from from uh, if I hit the ball cross court and the opponent hits it cross court back to me, I'm already kind of close there. 
And the farthest I can run is if he hits it down the line. So if he hits it down the line, I'm going to have to run to the line. But here we go again. If I hit it down the line, then the opponent is going to hit cross court. And if the opponent hits cross court, I'm going to have to run much wider because of the angle of his shot. So if, if we just visualize the court and I hit cross court, just visualize yourself hitting, visualize yourself hitting down the line. So you hit down the line and the opponent hits cross court in an angle. So you're going to run and you're going to be in the doubles alley. You're going to hit down the line again. And then the opponent is going to hit cross court again. And then you're going to have to run from the doubles alley to the other doubles alley. Now let's picture yourself hitting cross court. So if you hit cross court, the best the opponent can do is hit down the line straight to the singles line. So all you have to do is to run to the singles line. And you hit cross court again, and the opponent is going to hit down the line again. So you, all you have to do is go to the singles line again. So what do you prefer, to run to the doubles alley every time or to run only to the singles line? Yeah, beautiful point. Just to the singles line, unless, like you said, Edgar, <laughs> You want to exercise a lot. Yeah, then you want to exercise a ahead. lot. Keep hitting the ball down the line. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I, especially with the fitness level. You know, we're not as fit as team. You know, we can't do that all the time. Um, great stuff there. Um, so you have a section in your new course that is coming up very soon, which I'm excited about, Edgar. Um, the Singles Tactic Masterclass. It, you have a section on how we beat ourselves. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe give us one or two of those ways that we actually do end up beating ourselves so that we can know that and then stop doing it. All right. Well, basically, there's a, a few things that you can do right away to improve your chances of, of winning. And the first thing that you need to do is just kind of keep track of what is happening in the match. So you have to ask yourself, am I really getting beat or am I really beating myself? Mm -hmm. A lot of times what happens is we start the match and we're a little bit nervous and we're trying to hit these great shots because we know the opponent is pretty good. And uh, since I'm a little bit nervous, I start making mistakes and then I get a little bit more nervous. And obviously what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to make more mistakes. <laughs> and then it just keeps going like that. And then suddenly I realize, okay, I already lost the first set and I'm still kind of making mistakes. And uh, I'm nervous, I don't know what to do, and uh, I never get out of that situation, and I end up losing the match, and the, the other guy actually didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I just did everything. So, so the first thing that you need to do is in the changeover, okay, you know what? I'm making all the mistakes. So let's, let's first get the ball in. So let's get the first serve in. Don't try to kill it. Just get it in. Get the return, aim it in, at the middle of the court. Just get that ball in there. Hit every ball cross court. Why cross court? Because I'm hitting over the lower part of the net. I have more area to hit into. And it gets me in a better position. So I'm nervous. Hit cross court. Don't, don't hit down the line. Give yourself good, good targets. Once I do all that, maybe I'm trying to win and I don't have to do anything else. But let's say, okay, I did all that and I'm still losing. Okay, then I'm, I need to start thinking, okay, well, maybe let's see if I can attack a little bit more, change it here, change it there. But at least I set a base. You have to set a base. you got to make sure that, okay, I'm setting a base. I'm giving myself a chance. The opponent is still uh, beating me. So, okay, let's push it from there. But if you don't set a base, you're giving the match away. The other, uh, there's, there's several other things that, that are fairly easy for everyone to do. And one of them is what I said before, get the point started. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're returning a lob, but return it, get it in the court, make the opponent hit a next shot. Same thing on your serve. Uh, a lot of us, even if there might not be a huge difference between the first and the second serve, or maybe if it is, it, and we're missing the first serve every single time, uh, it might be better just to take a little bit off and, and just start getting it in. Get get your 50% per serves in. Try to shoot for that. Take some pace off, hit the ball with a little bit more spin. One of the big problems that I see at the amateur level 
is trying to this idea of a great shot in tennis is a bullet one inch over the net. <laughs> the reality is that is a terrible shot because even if it's hard, if it's so low, it is going to be short. The key in tennis is to keep the ball deep. Why? Because you're taking away the chance of the opponent to attack you. So even if it's softer and deeper, it's going to be more effective than really hard and short. Plus the other thing is if you're aiming so close to net, you're probably going to be making a lot of mistakes in the net. So one of the first things that I tell all my students is you have to make sure that you're not missing balls in the net. That should be your mantra any time that you practice. If you're hitting balls in the net, you're not aiming at the right height. You need to be aiming at least two nets high, at least. So basically, if you're practicing without thinking about it, you should never be hitting balls in the net. That should be your like your normal shot. Your normal shot is double net. Most players, the problem is that they see the net and they say, oh, all I have to do is clear that. And so they aim way too close to the net. And they make tons of mistakes into the net. So if you don't take anything away from this podcast, if the only if you only take away one thing is aim high. Don't make mistakes in the net. That in itself is really going to help your game. Other things. Do what you do best. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, there is no rule in tennis that I have to hit a forehand in this situation or a backhand in this situation or that I have to stay back or that I have to go net. You can do whatever you want. So play the odds. If you have a much better forehand than a backhand, try to never hit a backhand. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. If, you, if your ground strokes are terrible, but you're really good at the net, don't stay back a single moment. It doesn't matter. If, all, if what you do best is hitting slices, just hit slices the whole time. There is no rule. So do what you do best. Give yourself a chance. And also try to force the opponent to hit the balls they don't like to hit. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so basically your basic strategy is going to be is I'm going to hit the, best that, the shots that I hit best. And I'm going to force you to hit the ones that you don't like to hit. That's it. So those, yeah. those, are, those, are, those are simple things that, that uh, are very powerful and that really, really uh, help you win more matches. Understanding, for instance, understanding the situation. You should always know, okay, am I in a situation to attack? Am I in a neutral position or am I on defense? Where am I? Because if I'm trying to attack from a defensive situation, I'm going to make a ton of mistakes. I see a lot of players trying to hit bullets from six feet behind the baseline. Even if you make it, you're not going to do anything to the opponent. So again, you're risking a lot for a very little payback. Bad gambling in the casino, you're not, your money is not going to last that long. Okay, so you got to risk when the payoff is big. Payout is big, then you risk. When is the payout big? Okay, I have a forehand. I'm in a position to attack. The opponent is in trouble. Take a chance. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we should uh, go to the casino sometime together, Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> Do pretty well. But yeah, you know, I see it a lot, obviously, and that's why we're talking about it. Uh, I analyzed a, a video recently of two 4.5 players, and I noticed that, you know, some of the players, they were like hitting approach shots from behind the baseline and going in when the opponent was in the middle of the court in a comfortable position or they were going for, uh, you know, a winner, obviously, like outside of the doubles court and, you know, trying to do all these crazy things. Um, but you know, you've got to play the percentages and think about what the 
optimal shot is at the time. And and a, a, amazing advice about you know the the height of the ball. Um, in college, we used to I don't know the exact devices. It's pretty simple, but we would tie like some sort of rope, you know, like several inches above the net, so that we could practice hitting over it. So I feel like that something like that would would really benefit you in regards to what Edgar advised here. Um, but we have a bunch more questions that came in. Uh, so hopefully we won't be here all night. But uh, Samantha, again, uh, she asks, there's so much to think about during a tennis match. How do you do it all, especially during a tournament match when the nerves are also a factor? What do you think about that one? All right. What I would tell Samantha is that she has not really done her homework before she gets into a match. Because like I said before, a match, once you're playing, it should be automatic reaction. You're really not thinking, okay? You're really not, uh, no good player is going to be running to the ball and trying to figure out, okay, should I hit a cross court? Should I hit it down the line? Maybe a lob? Okay, what should I do? No. The good players, what they have done is they have put themselves into that situation so many times that it's like seeing a picture. It's like, oh, I recognize that picture. This is the, what I need to do. They, it's a reaction. They don't think. If you're thinking a lot, that means that you don't understand your game and that you don't are not really sure of what to do in every situation on the court. So the, your job is to kind of try to get together maybe with a tennis coach or something and, and just go over the basic situations that you might encounter on the court. Okay, when the ball is coming deep to my forehand and I'm in this in this position, where should I hit it? When the ball is coming short to my forehand, I'm inside the court, what are my options? When the, I have a, a, a high ball in the middle of the court, what should I do? When I have a really high deep ball that it's pushing me back, what should I answer? And so, you, you, you need to analyze the, the shots that you normally are getting and make sure that you understand what you, you should do in each of those situations. Once you understand what you need to be doing in each of these situations, then you need to practice each situation separately. For instance, uh, okay, if the ball is coming really high and deep to my backhand, I need to back up. And if I'm still backing up when I'm hitting it, I should probably just hit another high law back. Okay, if I if I recognize that the ball is going to come really deep, maybe I can go in and catch it in the air. That would be my second option. So practice with somebody, have somebody hit you that ball over and over and over. And you respond it the way that you're going to respond it, the, the way that you know that it's right. After a while, any time that you see that shot, you're going to respond like that without thinking about it. And that is exactly what you need to get to. And you have your strength, Samantha. So you know, okay, I like to hit my forehand in this position. I like to do that. So you try to, to look for those situations and try to create those situations so that you can use those strengths. But very, very important is you cannot be thinking during a match. All you have to be doing is looking at the ball and reacting. The time to think is on the changeover. And the changeover, you can analyze. You can say, okay, well, this is happening. This is what the opponent does well. This is what I'm not doing well. This is what the opponent does badly. So let's try to force it in, in, and make, it, make him or her play those shots that they don't like. But my general strategy in terms of, okay, where should I hit this ball? Where should I hit that other ball? That should be automatic. And if it's not... You got to go back to basic and, and, and practice. Yeah, beautiful advice there. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of just practicing these situations, as Edgar said, over and over again, so that it becomes second nature, so, so that you know, okay, you know, for example, this person has approached the net and they're at this part of the court, so I'm going to hit my pass here. Um, and yeah, you know, the brain is. Uh, an amazing thing. And so it'll, you know, tell you basically that I've been in this position, you know, thousands of times. And so this is the shot that I'm going to hit here. Um, and that'll help you a lot uh, along with, you know, your game plan before matches as well. So uh, great question there. Uh, and thank you for that answer, uh, Edgar. And we've got a bunch more. Uh, Irvin, how's it going? He asks, uh, this is more technical, I think, but what can you see as the, or what do you see as the keys to hitting a heavy topspin 
forehand or just a heavy forehand with good margin? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a, it's a technical question more. And uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think that the the better your your technique, that means that the, the better your your kinetic chain works, Yeah. The, the easier it is to use the whole body to accelerate the racket. Definitely, you need to be able to feel comfortable with topspin. So if you're not feeling comfortable with topspin, that should be your first step. So in order to hit a heavy forehand, you need to really feel comfortable with topspin and you need to be able to accelerate the racket head. So the, the, the ball is not going to be heavy if the, if the racket head is not going fast. So what I would do is I would practice diff hitting the ball at different heights and trying to swing as fast as I can and trying to hit as much spin as I can and just vary the height and vary the amount of spin. So if, if you if you also practice like hitting one ball flatter, one go ball with a, a little bit of spin, one ball with maximum spin, you're going to start getting the feel for, okay, what does it take to do those things? And also, okay, if I hit it at this height, how much spin do I need to hit it to be able to hit it fast and the ball still come into the court? Mm -hmm. Gotcha, Edgar. So uh, back to one of my questions. Um, how do we figure out what type of playing style best suits us? I mean, I, I do believe that, you know, there's a lot of us out there playing who actually don't even know, you know, what style we should be playing, you know, whether that's aggressive baseline or all court serve and volley. So how do we actually figure out what, what playing style is best for our game? You have to try to get to know yourself a little bit better and, and, and analyze what, what the options are. The, the tricky thing about that is that you have to match your physical abilities with your, uh, with, with, with the way you are mentally. You know, if, I mean, maybe you are you physically, you're able to, to play aggressive ground stroker maybe, but maybe as a person, you're very conservative. Mm. So it's kind of hard for you to just take those chances because that's just not the way, the way you see the world. Usually the way you play tennis is the way that you see the world. The problem is that one could be stopping you uh, to, to reach your, your, your full potential. Mm -hmm. The other way, it could also happen, right? So maybe you are, you're kind of small and maybe you don't have that much power, but you're just aggressive mentality. And so you just want to kill the ball <laughs> and play like that. Well, the problem is that playing like that, you're probably not going to be very good because you're physically not able to play that way. Mm. So you have to kind of find find a balance there. Find something that you're comfortable with, maybe push the, the limit a little bit. And, and basically, I think you have to kind of uh, start with physically what you're able to do. Are you really fast? Are you really strong? Uh, do you run really well? What you can do? Because the mental, you can kind of change it easier than the physical. You know, you Five foot tall, you're not going to be six. So <laughs> no matter how much you try, right? But you could try your mentality. You could try to change your mentality a little bit. And you could try to, to match it to, to the game style that, that might be more, more suitable for you. So I, I think that it, that is very, very important uh, that you, you really analyze, okay, what do I do well? If, if I want to be a, a more of a consistent player, well, I better move really well. If I don't move very well, that game style is not going to work, mm -hmm. right? So if if or or if I if I have big weapons, well, I should probably play aggressive. I should not really try just to to hang back there if I if I can do something with 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 the ball. So I should maybe look look into that more. If I if I'm six eight, well, I, I should probably ex explore the net play a little bit. You know what I mean? So. I, <laughs> I, I do feel there's a lot of mistakes out there and people not really taking advantage of, of their physical attributes on the court. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge, another huge point. If you don't take anything else away, that's a great one to take away as well. Um, so we have a question from Susan. Hello, Susan. Um, how about strategies for playing someone who predominantly uses chip shots and spins? How would you adjust against that type of player, Edgar? Well, I mean, the first thing that you need to try to do is understand how does this 
chip shot and spin work? You know, you have to be clear, okay, if they're hitting a spin with the forehand, which way can it bounce? And what is the likely uh, the likely outcomes of those shots? So so you, you need to try to practice against somebody doing that so that you start getting the feel of, okay, what what does how do I counter this thing? What I mean, do I slice it back or do I hit topspin? It it really depends on your uh, ability, technical ability. But uh, uh, most likely, if you're asking this question, is that you're not feeling very comfortable uh, understanding what's happening with those shots. Uh, those shots are effective usually to keep the ball low or and short. So I'm assuming that somebody that's playing against you like that is probably hitting deep and then suddenly short balls with 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 slice. And uh, if you're hitting with slice like that, one of the things that is difficult is to hit passing shots because you're not going to hit the ball very hard. Mm. So you might be able to take advantage by coming into the net a little bit. Yeah. The other thing is usually you don't you never know if that opponent most likely they don't like to come to the net either. If you don't like it, or maybe you do like it, but uh, what I would try to do to them is get them out of a situation where I, where they can do those things that are hurting me. So I have basically two options. Either I kind of practice and get used to what that means, or those situations, uh, how to counter those chip shots. I, I can get more comfortable coming into the net because they're usually probably going to give me a lot of short balls that I can come in. Mm -hmm. And the other option is to give them a short ball back and try to force them to come in and get them out of that situation. Got it, Edgar. When, you're, when you want to give them a short ball, um, do you actually, and let's say you're like in the middle of the court with, with them hitting a short ball and, and you want to hit the short ball back, do you hit that and you back up or do you hit that and you also go up while they're approaching? Uh, it, it really depends. It depends how, if, if you hit that short ball and you feel that you're going to force the opponent, it might be a good time to move in and try to hit the next ball as a volley. If you're hitting that ball short and you kind of uh, feel that the opponent is, it, I mean, they're going to be moving forward, but it's not going to be a very tough shot for them, you might as well back up. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Perfect. Thanks for that. Uh, we have a question from Alok again. Um, I try to hit every ball on the backhand side using a full swinged backhand. Sometimes after hitting a weak backhand, I lose the point and I regret it for not slicing. So how do I choose between a slice and a full swing backhand, which is <laughs> we mentioned in the beginning of the show, that scenario. But how do we decide? I'm, I'm assuming the full swing means a top spin shot or a, a yeah, drive. I I think yeah. so. Yeah, that that is a really good question. I mean, uh, that's I, I even see that in my game. I mean, uh, I play with a lot of slice backhand just because I can keep the ball deep and hardly miss. And my Thompson backhand is pretty good, but it's a little bit more risky. And I am not sure if I'm really forcing the opponent that much more. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that we go back to the casino thing, right? So, am I really benefiting from hitting my full topspin backhand, or it's really not doing that much? I mean, it it looks good, it feels good, it feels like I'm attacking, but am I really attacking that much more? Am I taking more risk by hitting my topspin than my slice? So, you have to really understand your game and 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 be really uh, be objective you know really be objective and, and uh, i mean everybody loves to hit a great top spin backhand but okay am i really having a payoff on that backhand if not stick with the slice look for forehands look for something else there's yeah. a, there, there's a situation where you have to hit a top spin backhand like if somebody attacks att attacks you and comes to the net but other than that, most of the time, a good deep slice backhand is enough against most players. Yeah, work for Graf. <laughs> yeah, work um, for a lot of players. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it was interesting to see, you know, Dominic, 
um, hitting a lot more slices at the end. And, you know, yep. I think it's probably because he was tired and struggling. Um, and so that also evidence is that it, it takes less energy, you know, to, uh, to slice and to rip a backhand like that. So that's another thing to think about. Um, uh, you've given us a lot of great tactics here and strategies, Edgar, but I was wondering uh, to make it a little more, I guess, well, to make it USTA specific, what is yep. one powerful uh, tactic that comes to mind that you can give us for USTA players that they can implement quickly and, and start winning more, uh, more matches and points? Well, the bottom line is that there's only a few things that you can do in terms of strategies when you're playing, right? So, I mean, basically there are eight things that you can do. Either you can out-rally your opponent, you can overpower your opponent, you can try to use your strengths during that point, you can try to attack the weaknesses, you can rush the net, you can force the opponent to rush the net, you can use variety, or you can really try to open the court. I mean, those are basically the eight things that you can do on any specific point in the match. And as a player, you're going to, depending on your game style, you're going to do more of those in most of the points and maybe a few of, of those in other points or none of those in other points. But those are the eight options that you really have when, you, when you're playing and that you should ex, uh, exploit, right? So before the points start, you should kind of choose one of those eight things. And most people just kind of choose them by just automatic because that's the only thing they do every time. You know, so, okay, I'm always going to try to use my weapon, you know, or I'm always just going to try to focus on the weakness of the opponent, or I'm going to just be consistent. I'm just not going to make mistakes anytime. But what the, the important thing is that you, you, you understand that you have options and that maybe what you do in specific points in the match can make a huge difference. Maybe you're not as a volleyer at all, but at four all 30, 40 with the opponent serving, Maybe just running to the net is going to be enough to scare them and have them miss the passing shot. So you have to, you have to understand that these uh, options that you have, you might not use them every time, but you should use them sometime. And you should, should understand that you have them there. Using variety, for instance, you know, I mean, why not hit a few locks sometimes? Just mix it up. Give them a couple of cut balls, something like that. So kind of try to use your full potential as a player and not just the, the shots that you always use, always use. You know, maybe maybe you like to, maybe you love to come to a net. Okay, well, it's great, but maybe sometimes mix it up, stay back a little bit. Have them guessing. Is he going to come in? Is he going to stay back? What's going to happen? So... I think uh, just in general, the, the, the advice, I mean, it is very difficult to give a blanket advice mm -hmm. for all levels of players. But uh, definitely, you need to know what you do well and try to do that as much as possible. Try to focus on understanding the opponent's game. A lot of times we are so worried about our game that we don't even think about what the opponent is going through. The opponent is having the same problems as you are having. You just got to figure it out. You just got to be thinking a little bit more about the opponent's problems, not so much about your problems. So try to put yourself in the, in the opponent's uh, position and try to really understand. You, you should be able, after two or three games, to answer the question of, what can they do well and what do they have problems with? How are they winning points? How am I winning points? If you're not asking yourself those questions during the changeovers, you're just not taking advantage of, of opportunities. You need to be looking for patterns. I think that is very, very important. If you're playing somebody and they keep serving wide and you keep being surprised, Okay, the first time they serve wide, okay, surprise, yeah, I surprised. <laughs> Second time, 
Okay. I should have been expecting it. Okay. Surprise, surprise. Let's say. But if they do it eight times and they keep surprising you, you you're just not doing your job. That is not a surprise. That you're just not 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 thinking straight. Okay. You you need to be looking for those patterns because the opponent is going to do what they do best over and over, and they're gonna do it more in key points. So if the opponent keeps keep passing you cross court, cross court, every time you go to net, they hit a cross court. Every time you go to net, they hit a cross court. Well, if they, you finish the match <laughs> and all you can say is, well, they kept passing the cross court, well, you're not doing your job. You should have yeah. realized that in the second game and cover the cross court and force them to hit down the line. Maybe they don't even know how to hit down the line. So come to the net and just run to the side where they always hit it and see if they can hit it to the other side. If they keep serving cross court, well, stand on the in the alley. See if they can hit to the T. Look for patterns and exploit that. A lot of times, just keeping those in your mind. Let's say you're playing against somebody and you see that they're getting really close to the net when they go to the net. Well, you have two options there. You start lobbing right away or you wait till it's a key point. Maybe it's a break point. Great chance. I have not lobbed a single time. Okay, next time they go to net, if they come in on this point, I'm going to lob. That's the point I'm, I'm betting. That's where the big payoff is. If I'm able to lob it, that's it. I break, done. Yeah, I mean, you've got to be a problem solver on the court. I remember, especially when I was in a, a junior, you know, I didn't really think at all on the court. And gradually, you know, I was exposed to more experts and coaches and, and thought more about the game. And it's really fulfilling, you know, when you're trying to figure things out and you're actively thinking about, you know, how you can maximize using your strength against your opponent's weaknesses. And then you actually, you know, figure out on key points what is most likely. And then you actually succeed um, or you figure it out, but maybe you don't execute. But still, it's just a great feeling to, to know that, you know, I have the ability to actually um, impact the match through to through my thinking and strategy and and it's just really fun so you've definitely got to you know up your game and, and recognize patterns um, that's a part of the fun of the game so I mean, that, um, that is a big I think that's a big thing in tennis I mean that's what makes it a lot of fun and that's what makes it a lot of fun playing against a lot of different people the problem that I see a lot is that people avoid playing against players that they feel uncomfortable with yeah so, oh, I hate playing pushers. No, I'm not going to. I hate playing against that lady because she's a pusher. Well, if you want to get better, the only way to get better is to become those people's best friend. So yeah. if, you hate, if you hate playing against this lady, the only way you're going to get better is just inviting this lady to play over and over and over until you feel comfortable. I mean, that's the way it is. Human nature... Uh, unfortunately kind of forces us to act against our best interests a lot of times. Yes. So uh, if I know I, I need to get in shape, well, I probably need to start running. But if I hate running, well, that, then I'm not going to get in shape. So <laughs> that's yeah. my option, right? So that is how you need to look at the game. You need to really try to try to play against the players that you don't like playing because they're the ones that are going to teach you how to handle those type of games. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Just a quick shout out on Facebook. We got some comments there too. Uh, Robert, a uh, nice suggestion there. He mentioned um, the in and out tennis line calling device is great, and it gives you statistical feedback on players' shots. So it sounds like Ja, your earlier question about stats and stuff, that could be something to look into. The in out tennis line calling device. Um, Edgar, uh, one other question. Then I want to ask you about um, about your latest course that's coming out soon. Um, this could be, you know, a mental one too, but Alfonso asks, why do I lose my serve when I'm up 40 love? <laughs> <laughs> We've all done it, Alfonso. Come on, Alfonso. What's going on? Yeah. Close you it out, man. You really need to answer that question. Uh, most, most likely what happens is, uh, uh, like, like we've talked about it many times, tennis is a, is a mental game. So you're obviously not doing the things that are winning you points at some point. So you're probably playing a certain way until you get up on the score and then change the way that you're playing. And yeah. even if you do it just a little bit, that a lot of times is enough to, to create the problem. So a lot of times we don't really feel it as because it's not like, 
okay, I was super aggressive and then I'm not aggressive at all. No, usually it's it's kind of like I was super aggressive and then I just kind of was aggressive. I wasn't the super aggressive that I was before. So it's just a little bit of a difference that that makes a huge difference. And obviously now it's in your head. So now every time that you're up 40 love, you're probably thinking about, oh my God, I'm gonna lose this game again. So you, what you need to do is you, you basically just need to play one point at a time and you keep doing the things that you, that you should be doing the whole game. So because that's, that's how tennis is. Tennis is a game, one more, we go back to the casino. Ten, tennis is a game of probability. You don't need to win all the points. You just need to win a few more than the opponent. That's right. And so you just got to figure out, okay, what is my best strategy to win a few more points than my opponent? That's all I need to figure out. And yeah, I just need to stick with it. Okay, I know that this is going to eventually pay off. So maybe I'm going to the net, the opponent is passing me. Okay, well, close game, but he passed me a few times. I'm going to keep going. Why? Because I know that it's not the same thing to pass me at 0-0 zero, zero than at 4-all. And if I keep attacking him, they're, go they're going to start getting nervous and they're going to start uh, maybe thinking, okay, is he going to attack me now when it's really getting close? And that's where I'm going to get my points. So my advice to you, Alfonso, is figure out what is the best strategy for you to win points and stick with it, no matter the score. That's right. That's right, uh, Edgar. And um, I'm not a degenerate gambler by any means, but, you know, I liken it to, you know, when you're playing a poker hand and, you know, there's an optimal play that you need to make. But, you know, sometimes a lot of players, they think about the money aspect of it and they let that kind of uh, dictate their decision or make them s play scared or uh, suboptimally. So it's the same thing, you know, when you're thinking about the score, uh, instead of thinking about the optimal play, the optimal shot and so forth, you're thinking about, oh, I'm up at the, you know, 40 love and all that. And then that kind of messes up, you know, your thinking uh, and your play. So you just want to stick to keep thinking about what is optimal and what will win you the points and what have you been doing that has been winning you the points, like Edgar said. So um, great stuff there. Edgar, I want to ask you a little bit about your new upcoming singles tactics masterclass. Obviously, from you know all this knowledge that you're giving us, we can tell easily that you're a great expert in this aspect of the game. And so, um, can you let us know a little bit about uh, what the singles tactics masterclass is all about? Well, really, what I wanted to do is uh, create a course that is really going to touch on every aspect of single strategy and that it's going to give everyone that goes through the courts several ideas that, that they can implement right away and improve their their games i wanted them to to really understand what the tactical aspect of of tennis is and uh, what what does it mean to play tactically smart like like we clarified earlier that it's not thinking about it when you're playing it is understanding the situation and it's reacting to certain situations with the shots that are going to give you the best chances of winning the point. So that is very, very important. So how do you get yourself to that point? Well, you have to understand the geometry of the court. You have to understand how tennis works. You have to understand what happens if I hit the ball cross court from this position. What, what, what is the most likely re uh, return from the opponent? What happens if I hit this shot from this position? Where, where am I opening the court? Am I, uh, am I hitting a shot that is going to diminish my chances of winning the point? What's happening? So you have to understand every, every situation that you may encounter on the court. You need to understand, okay, what is my goal of my first serve? What do I need to consider every time I hit a first serve in order to win more, more uh, games? What, I, what, I, what is my strategy on my second serve? What should I be thinking? And so once you understand all these laws of the battle that I call it, okay, so how do I incorporate those laws into my game? How, how do I make myself play automatically and still respect these games? Still hit cross court when I should be hitting cross court. Still hit the ball high when I should be hitting high. Still attacking when, when uh, it's, it's an attackable ball and not something that is going to hurt me after I come to the net. So 
Uh, it's a very in-depth course, and it's going to answer all of your questions in terms of uh, how do I win more? How, what do I need to, to play smarter tennis? And uh, the, the other thing that I really like is that it's very practical. I mean, I, I'm a very practical coach because I still like to play a lot. And I, I grew up playing competitively and I played competitively my whole life. I, I uh, coach high performance players and I've also coached club players. I, I coach at, at, at any level of the game, but it's always been on court and very practical. So everything that I write and that I create is for people to just kind of go through and apply right away. Perfect. Awesome, Edgar. Excited about that. Um, and just curious, like, what is the structure of the course? Uh, how is it broken down? I assume it's uh, video and so forth. Any details uh, about that? It's all video based. So what what I do is basically I, I grab all the subjects and then you have a video per subject. Got it. Cool. Cool. Very good. And um, I mean, is there any uh like how long is it uh do you know like approximately and you know number of videos anything like that it has more than 100 videos in it and uh, it's a uh, it's i don't know exact time but it's more than three hours nice long. yeah oh, so nice. It's, it's it's very very comprehensive yeah, yeah. No, i like that because it's you know it's it's quite a few videos but it sounds like they're bite-sized pieces for each one so that you can digest them Yes, the, I, I try to keep all the videos under five minutes so you can easily go through the course one by one. And uh, it's, it's a very nice software so you can mark where you are and you can, uh, as, as soon as you, you get the course, you know exactly the outline of the whole course. Mm -hmm. and you can go through the whole course or you can skip a little bit. I mean, we, I, I suggest you go through the whole course first and then just kind of go back to the, to the points that that apply a little bit more to to your game but in it you you will learn like different strategies also to learn to play against different players you you will learn uh, the the eight different strategies for each point the the eight different options you know either be consistent be aggressive go to net bring the opponent to a net etc uh, the fundamental tactical um, basis of, of tennis like, okay, tennis is a cross-court game. I, we've talked a lot about that. Why is it a cross-court game? Uh, making sure that you start the point right. Just uh, very, very practical stuff. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure any, any player that wants to improve their game will find it very useful. Uh, as you know, Mervyn, I, I work with uh, Tennisgate, mm -hmm. which uh, that, that's a platform where we're, we're starting the, the course. And it's one of our... Actually, it's our first course in, in the platform, and we're hoping to have a lot of more courses coming up. Awesome. That's fantastic. So obviously, if they want to check it out. I mean, there's a couple of ways. You know, you can you go to Tennis Gate as well and check on there. And then um, also, if you're a part of my uh, subscriber email list, which you can go to TennisFiles.com and just um, subscribe, and you'll get some really cool emails and um uh, free uh, ebook as well if you haven't already um, and then I'll let you know um, when it comes out as well because we're not exactly like it's it coming up in the near future right Edgar pretty much yeah, it should be, it should come out uh, at the end of this month or, or early next month perfect awesome that's really exciting um, I'm sure it'll do really well I got a chance to kind of look at the the structure and it looks really good um, and obviously you have a lot of great knowledge about uh, single strategy and tactics so that's fantastic uh, just checking to see if there's any other questions here that we might want to apply. I know I saw one about uh, strategy against a grinder, but we already uh, talked about that, Andrew, so you can rewind and check that out. Um, let's see. Metaverse technique. Um, okay. I think that's about it, Edgar. I want to ask you um, a question of my own, uh, which is, You've given us a lot of great advice um, on the show today, but what is one key tip that you can give us um, to help us improve our single strategy and tactics? <laughs> I think I have given you a lot of keys. I know. You <laughs> either pick one of those or you can give us a new one or an overall type of thing. 
I think if if I were to pick one thing that is very very important is to know your game. Get, go back to that. Go back to understand what can you do and what can't you do. When when am I taking risks and when am I not taking risks? Where what what where should I hit these shots? And where should I not hit these shots? So what, what I'm saying is basically is understand at what speed are you comfortable with your shot and you can play consistently for all your shot. And at what speed are you taking risks? Mm -hmm. And what kind of shots are you taking more risks and maybe not getting the rewards? Just like that example with the slice where it was the top spin backhand. Okay, are you really benefiting from the top spin? Are you taking more risk when you're hitting with the top spin and benefiting less? So you you have to make a really you have to really analyze your game and really come up with a clear understanding of what do I do best? What are my top speeds in every situation on the court for every of my shots? When am I taking risks? And uh, try to really, once you, once you understand that, then it's going to be a lot easier to answer the question, am I losing or uh, is the opponent beating me? Okay, so you're going to be able to cut down your mistakes by understanding what it means to play percentage tennis. Playing to the best of your ability, that's all you can do. If you try to play above your ability, then you're going to be beating yourself. That's right. Love it. Love it. Thanks a lot, Gary. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure, and I see a lot of great um, comments here, you know, I'm just putting a few on the screen. Thanks for the great advice. Thanks to you, Mervon and Edgar. I uh, see Ramon in here. How's it going, Ramon? Uh, great interview, Mervon and Edgar. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, um, that's great. I, I want to ask you, obviously, you know, you mentioned Tennis Gate or any other, um, you know, accounts or social or anything like that where people can follow what you're doing and uh, correspond with you as well. Yep, I have a YouTube uh, channel. Perfect. Uh, Giffenick Tennis. Okay, perfect. And, and then I have also a web, web page uh, with I have blogs, and that's edgargiffenick.com. Perfect. And Tennisgate. So those are, those are kind of the outlets, and uh, you will find blogs and videos and advice in, 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 in all of those. If perfect. you haven't checked out Tennisgate, I think it's a great platform. With a, with a lot of content and uh, you will enjoy it. But uh, yeah, check out the YouTube channel, check out the website. Uh, I have the, those couple of books, Developing High Performance Players and Play Tennis with Passion. The Developing High Performance Players is a little bit more focused on coaches, but the Play Tennis with Passion, I think it would it's a great source for any passionate player. And I think everybody that's listening to us is probably a passionate player because they would not be listening to a <laughs> tennis <laughs> podcast if they weren't. So it, it was meant really for, for uh, amateurs hoping to improve their games. And it's very practical. Awesome. Well, that, that's fantastic. Uh, and I'm definitely going to include all the links that we just mentioned uh, about Edgar's, uh, you know, his uh, books and the, the content that he creates and everything. Um, on the show notes page and uh, also on this YouTube page as well very soon. So, uh, Edgar, I just want to thank you uh, very much for coming on to the Tennis Falls podcast. It was fun to have you on. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll see you soon again on the summit and on other content. So everybody definitely check out, um, you know, check out Edgar's stuff. Check out Tennis Gate and uh, Edgar Giffenick Tennis dot com, the YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody, for uh, attending this live stream. It was a lot of fun. And thank you in advance, everybody who listens on the audio podcast version. And thank you, Edgar. Uh, appreciate you coming on.
Thank you, Mervan. It's always a pleasure working with you and all the good uh, work that you're doing, all the good information that you're putting out there for all the enthusiastic players there. So keep it up. Thanks a lot, Edgar. Same with you. And we'll uh, let everybody know, of course, about the course coming out soon as well. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Edgar. And have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. You too.